thank you, Mr. Chairman, for having this hearing. And um, uh, it's been one of my, uh, I think, uh, concerns, greatest concerns in terms of the federal workforce. And it's not just about the website. Although the website is the hello, how are you introduction to federal service. And um, that hasn't been the friendliest hello, how are you introduction that we could have. And so that's why the website takes maybe a larger than life um, role in this discussion of the future of the federal workforce. And so I look forward to an ongoing dialogue beyond this round table, but also um, working with the chairman um, uh, to stay on top of the challenges we have in not only recruitment, but also retention of um, great federal workers. Um, I think there's a whole lot of things we could talk about from morale to pay to benefits to you know uh, um, opportunities that may look more attractive in the private sector and how we recruit the best and brightest. But um, I think we'll get into that as we are going around the round table. And, um, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to recognize Senator Tester, who just has some opening comments. I think he used to sit in these chairs and has a great reputation for being someone who is deeply concerned about the federal workforce. That's okay. Sure it is. <laughs> well, I think, you know, 6% per year, you've got to, I mean, and if you, well, I, I continue. I didn't yeah, so it's a, it, it is absolutely point well taken. Um, you know, retention of millennials is important. We do know that... Um, you know, many would suggest that millennials have a different outlook on employment. They don't come looking for a 30-year contract like folks did in the past. Um, and, but we do know that um, obviously we need to do all we can to help ensure that those individuals feel welcome into the system, that they have a good experience, that they're onboarded uh, well, that they receive training and development, so that as long as they're with us, they have a great experience. And in the event they leave, we, sh we need to create ways that they can come back later on in their careers after they've perhaps had an opportunity to grow and develop. Um, and, and uh, you know, candidly, one of the areas where um, there is some opportunity for improvement is um, legislation that would help kind of facilitate that movement in and out of the system, because it is, it is not something that is, uh, you know, explicitly provided for right now. What, what's your reaction to, you know, sending over a list and 70 percent are deemed unqualified by the, by the agency? Um, to me, that is a failure of the assessment process. Um, or I'm sorry, are you talking about when, it's refer when they're referred to a manager yeah, or? To, to, referred to a manager. I think Linda said, look, you know, in some agencies, they'll get a list of, you know, 50 applicants who um, you say are meet minimum qualifications when they're sent to the agency, would you, 70 percent was your number, right? 70 percent washed out because they weren't anywhere near meeting the minimum qualifications for that job, according to the agency. I think just to, just to make sure we're all talking about the same thing, <laughs> what I heard is a little something different. I think what, what, what I heard was there's a list that's created not by OPM, but by the agency HR staff, which is the qualification list. And an, a hiring manager can choose to hire someone or not. And what I heard Linda say is that in some instances, and I'm quite interested in that, that statement, the 70% of those lists are returned to the HR shop without anyone being hired from it. And so... This, this, is, this is the case. So, okay. so, that's, so I just want to, I just want to be... So you're right. I mean, No, 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 it's okay. But I mean, I, I think you, you point to there's a real problem here, and I think it's an assessment problem that what's happening is the hiring managers are given a list that they look at and say, this doesn't do it for me. And that means the process hasn't worked appropriately. Part yeah. of it is that the well, hiring manager. Imagine the frustration, and, and you guys see it from the standpoint of the agency. Imagine the frustration of the people on that list. You know, that the list has been advanced, and, and all of a sudden they're told. But this, this is not an assessment process problem. It's a veteran's preference problem. Uh, okay. and, and I would argue Because it, the minimum qualification requirements are what the veterans meet, and they are placed at the top of the list of a highly qualified group. Okay. And, they, and that is done at the point at which minimum qualifications are determined. They also go through the rest of the assessment process along with others that go through the assessment process. Some agencies have very sophisticated multi-hurdle assessment processes. It's not the assessment process. It's the fact that a group of people are in fact referred at the top of the list based only on minimum qualification requirements. So even if they are assessed, regardless of whether they are assessed, if you have a high candidate pool and a large number of veterans, 
they will always be at the top of the list. And when a manager looks down the list, they see better qualified candidates because they're seeing individuals that not only met the minimum but also got their rank mm -hmm. in the highly qualified list by, by virtue of Practice. the assessment. So if I could just clarify that a bit. Um, the law requires that um, disabled veterans who meet the requirements of the job uh, at a minimum proficiency, a minimum proficiency level, and I'll, I'll clarify that in a bit, um, those individuals should have absolute preference to get a job. Mm -hmm. um, one of the common things we hear is that, gee, we, we have to uh, consider these folks based only on the bare minimum qualifications. So if they meet those, we have no choice but to send them forward. Um, the reality is that agencies, agency HR uh, staff have the ability to establish a minimum proficiency level, which is different from minimum qualifications. I don't want to get hung up on technicalities, but essentially an agency can define requirements above and beyond OPM administered government-wide qual qualifications and say, you know what, on a scale of a uh, proficiency scale of one to 10 on communications, I need somebody who's at least an eight or they're not going to be able to do this job. That's not in the OPM standard. But the agency can make that determination that there is, there is a set of factors above and beyond minimum qualifications that can be applied to ensure that that disabled veteran can be successful in the job, that they have the right level of skills in order to perform so in that can, job. Can I ask a, a question uh, with disabled veterans? It seems to me that what they should have is they should have somebody within this system who is you know, their advocate who looks at what their skills are and then works to place them where they are qualified, as opposed to, you know, a, a system that, that automatically assumes qualification. You know, I, I think there's tons of things that many of our veterans, including our disabled veterans, can do for this country and can do for the federal government. I recently had this experience out at uh, Grand For or, uh, Minot Air Base where the civilian workforce was extremely challenged. Thank you, OPM, for coming. And, and I asked all the veterans in the civilian workforce to stand up, and it was over half of them. Mm -hmm. So we know that they're still into the mission. They're still committed to um, serving their country, just in a different context. Why don't we create an office within OPM of advocacy for disabled veterans so that, that um, those professionals would be looking for opportunities, not just to give someone a job, but to give them a job that they can perform, that they can be um, you know, uh, you know, enriched in. I, you know, to me, to me that, th what we, we got the tail wagging the dog here. We should, if we care about our disabled veterans, we should be advocating for them in the system rather than simply advancing their name into jobs that, that um, uh, someone along the line says, look, you know, you may be at the top of the list, but you're, you're not going to be successful and, as a result, not happy right. Senator, in so the job. I think that's a, a terrific suggestion and an important one. I, I, I think that there are two different issues that are at play here. You know, one of them is I think it would be phenomenally powerful for you to examine veterans' preference. I think there are better ways to do this. You suggested one that would be very attractive. <laughs> By and large, the government uh, you know, goes through the process that Linda described of post and pray. You just put it up there and you hope someone comes to you. You know, it would be much better if we were recruiting the very best veterans for government as, again, the best private sector companies do as well. So there's a lot of work associated with that that's possible. I think the, the problem underlying the, the scary statistic that you heard is actually um, more than the, the, the issue of veterans' preference. I actually think veterans' preference isn't the primary piece of it. Um, I think it really is a failure to actually have a process that's designed to find the right talent for the jobs. So what ends up happening is there's an HR function that has become largely separated from the mission function. So frequently, and this is not always the case because there are corners of government that do this well, but frequently in setting up the qualifications or the requirements for a job, the HR folks do it, not the people that actually understand the needs. Um, the HR people actually own the process from end to end rather than having the hiring manager setting up what the requirements are on the front end, making sure that they're involved to ensure that, that the right people are actually being selected who can meet those requirements and then fundamentally picking the best talent. They've been s separated out in a, in, a, in a way that means that you end up with people that are unqualified on these lists, which is why these lists get kicked back. 
That's the primary problem in my this view. Isn't, this isn't restricted to federal. Right. I mean, using words and resumes um, will, in fact, keep you to the top, and they all know what the game is. Right. And, and here I'd add, um, this is one of the main emphases of our Hiring Excellence Campaign, where we are talking to agencies about the importance of assessment. We are familiarizing them with the various types of approaches that can be used. There, obviously, the self-rating, uh, self-assessment uh, approach does have merit, some merit. Um, many other ways to do it, structured interviews, um, you know, training and experience evaluations, t situational job tests, um, many different things that can be done, and, and these are things that are widely used in, in other sectors of employment. Um, but for many reasons, some good, not so, some not so good, we, we don't do a good job of this uh, overall in the federal government. And that's why we're very focused on talking to both hiring managers and HR people to get them to at least understand the vernacular and the importance of, of good assessment. And that should be the beauty of USA Jobs, right. is that they don't have to then post themselves, that they should be able to expedite their hiring by looking at who's applied. So can I, can I take this one step further? Even better than going having an agency go back and mine the other resumes, a, a better system would be if the gentleman who applied for this job didn't get that job but was qualified to do it, someone else got it. And other agencies should be able to hire immediately that person for the same kind of forklift job. And that's what the Competitive Services Act permits. So for the first time, you've now given the agencies a new tool that allows them to think holistically about talent. In order for that tool to be useful, several things have to happen, including OPM needs to put out regulations, and, they need to, and agencies need to think about this very differently than they've ever done before. And that's something that you can help encourage them to do. Because it is, it, this is, you know, what you've described here, this is a new world. Um, the system we have today was a world when someone could go into a single uh, warehouse and say, I want the job here. Now you apply on the web. You can apply, you know, anyone anywhere can be applying for a job. Public notice means that everyone actually is aware of this. And that's a good and, and challenging thing. The challenge is you get a ton of resumes and the process can become more complicated. But we need a system that actually accommodates for that substantial change. Actually, I, I'm going to disagree with that because, you know, we, we've done this for agencies. We, we hired 300 federal air marshals in 45 days. Got them through the drug test, got them through the background investigation, got them through all the screening. And the process was, is really what's called open continuous. And open continuous job postings are, you're always recruiting. You're always taking in applications. You should always be recruiting. You should always be recruiting. You should never stop. Because in this, what this does is it, it's a stop, start, stop, start. So I know I need, in the National Park Service, I'm going to say you need, let's just say 2,000 air, air conditioning mechanics. Right. You should have one posting. You should be always taking in applications. The first thing that should happen when your guy goes in and puts his application in, the first thing that should happen is within a couple of days, there should be a phone screen of that candidate. It should be done immediately. And then from the phone screen, there should be an assessment of where that candidate ranks, potentially in the next hiring round. There should be active communication that says, here's when we're going to hire. We just hired 200. It looks like we're going to hire another 200 in second quarter. Hang in there. If you want your application to stay active, keep it active. We ping all of our applicants every 60 days. And, and if you're regionally challenged, you don't want to move out of this region, then right. we know that. I want, to, I want to get to the 22 million applications. There is a finite number of people who want to work for the federal government in this country. And it seems to me that understanding and knowing who they are, that they're interested in a career or an opportunity in the federal government, they file a job application, there should be some way to maintain the, the database of 22 million applications and skill sets, as, as Linda's talking about. To me, this is a little bit of a catch-up deal. Um, you know, in the era of big data, when we know we can do tons of sorts, that there is tons of data points, why aren't we doing something like Linda's suggesting in terms of um, these 22 million? Because these 22 million are going to make application once. Um, and, and, it's not 22 uh, million people, it's 22 million it's applications. 22 million applications. Um, uh, uh, this is a great opportunity for me to share some of the work we've been doing with the USA Jobs Agency Talent Portal. There is 
um, new functionality, which you've, you've got to be able to um, register to log into it, but it's functionality that enables you to do exactly the kinds of things you're talking about. Um, it is knowing where these 22 million applicants are coming from and being able to look at uh, geographically, so, so these for 22 example. million would include, you know, somebody may have put in five applications. Uh, right, right. Or I'm applying for a promotion, you know, in my So same in case. terms of total numbers of people, Accessing how, what? What is the total number of people? There are 11 million uh, account holders. Okay, so there are many others people. who use the system uh, to do. I mean, there were a billion job searches performed. Um, so there are many others that use the system that you know are browsing and don't register. But but 11 million. Okay. We know geographically where all those 11 million people are. We can see what jobs they're applying for. We can see um, uh, you know what schools they go to or have gone to. Um, so to your point, there are many data, key data points in here that we can use to um, inform things like um, the success of a recruiting strategy. So for example, if I go out and I recruit heavily in a particular area, um, I can later on go into USA Jobs and see how many people applied from that area. So I can determine whether or not that was a good investment for me to to re recruit there. Likewise, if I see there are a whole bunch of candidates sitting in a particular location, and I have the option of maybe filling the job there or filling it somewhere else, it can direct me maybe to fill it there because I might have a better chance of getting a good quality candidate. So there, there's, there are uh, lots of interesting things going on with that agency talent portal and um, you know, we'd be loved These to- These are two sides to a different coin. Number one, the applicant looking for opportunities, but the agency looking for qualified applicants. Absolutely. And so, so the, the point would be what, if, if I'm the, the park manager, and I, I just lost my uh, uh, air conditioning guy. Mm -hmm. I can't wait 80 days for you to tell me who's coming through. I've lost a whole season. Plus, I got to get somebody on the ground who can fix my air conditioner. And so the, 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 the ability to go onto the site or the ability to work with OPM to say, who do you know within, within the next you know, 30 days can come to the Grand Canyon and provide services and, and would be interested in this job. Yeah, and this is, uh, again, as Max mentioned, the Competitive Service Act um, and sharing certificates. These are people who have been determined to be not only qualified, but best qualified. Um, and what the act allows agencies to do is share, the, share that so, information. So what's your reaction to Max saying, you know, we need to hold you accountable for implementation? Um, I agree, because again, this has to, this is a culture change at the agency level, where agencies are going to have to, first thing that should come to mind is, you know, my, my manager comes to me with a need, and my knee-jerk reaction is, okay, well, let me, let me do the job announcement and let's post that. My reaction should be, gee, why don't I take a look and see what else is out there? Yeah. Who's already recruited for this type of a position, the same grade level, uh, people who are interested in working in a particular location? And it shouldn't be that USA Jobs is the only way you're doing that. So, I mean, I think the broader point, and this is why USA Jobs is one tool, is that agencies ought to be using the full set of normal tools that any organization typically uses to recruit actively the right talent for the positions. The reality is there's more talent interested in federal jobs than the government actually needs. The bigger problem is that government is not doing a good job at actually pulling in the right talent uh, for those jobs. I'm not suggesting that government shouldn't be recruiting. I think it would be great if more talented people wanted to come in the federal government, but that is a, a secondary problem relative to the primary one in government's inability to actually access the right talent uh, that it needs that's already available to it. And that's where I think your, your investment will actually produce you know, bigger dividends. Right. And student interns, please don't forget them because right. that's a big deal and you avoid a lot of this assessment issue because you got the best assessment possible. I, I find this whole discussion, you know, I think we just scratched the surface of this, um, and which, is, which is frustrating for me. Um, but I, I think the idea that OPM should be more dynamic, should be looking more um, not just as a as a processor of paper, but a recruitment of talent. How do you how do you make respond to concerns that applicants have that that this is the deep dark hole? My application goes in, I don't hear back. I've already I mean I've got student loans to pay, as Senator Tester was talking about. You know I I think you're trying very hard, and and you know I think responding to some of these concerns. But we're wondering what additional, I'm wondering, what additional tools 
we need to give to meet, the, meet what I think is the common mission here, which is to recruit the best and brightest and make sure that we are the, the you know, we used to talk about this in terms of supply, but that we are the employer of choice. Yep. The federal government should be the employer of choice. Mm -hmm. This is working for the people of our country. That what greater mission could you have? And and so I'm I'm interested, Mark, in ongoing discussions. I think you guys have done some great work. I certainly have had a very positive experience with OPM, as you know, um, responding to my unique concerns in North Dakota. But um, I I I think that as somebody who believes in public service who believes that there should be opportunities for veterans. I'm curious about what more we can do. Uh, Max gave us a great list. I think Linda gave us a great list of challenges. Um, and I'll be working with those lists to kind of think about what the next steps are in communicating with you.